Hello class, welcome to Comparative Politics. Now today we're doing it in a very unusual way, probably more usual for you. Um, it's going to be done by, by video. So, um, our, today's class is on uh, the UK and France, but before I, I say, but before we talk about that, let me remind you that uh, on the 15th, uh, Paula Amaya, uh, Rabiul Arif, Natasha Guzman, uh, Cassandra Millen, Loshani Prasad, Christian Santos, and Malika Christopher are all uh, presenting on the 15th. And as you know, uh, no excuses will be tolerated, so um, please come ready to, to present, have your PowerPoint ready, no more than 10 minutes, um, as well as a bibliography for, for me, okay? Um, all right. All right, so we're talking about the UK and, and France, right? So, the, so these two chapters talk about the political development of those two countries. Um, they inform us about the distinctions between an Anglo-Saxon model, an Anglo-Saxon model, and a and the French model of, of government. Okay. <clears throat> now, Britain and 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 the, the, the United States uh, focus more on the individual, and France. The French model focuses more on people as a group, or or what I can what we can call group rights. So it's individual liberty, uh, a la John Locke, uh, versus collective liberty, uh, versus uh, a la Rousseau. So what does the Anglo-Saxon model mean? It's liberal in the sense of Locke, with the focus on individual liberty, right? Everyone fend for for yourself. Let, let people defend and fend for themselves. Right? When you think of that, you think of other liberal, liberal theorists like, um, like Adam Smith. Right? If we each pursue our own rational self-interest, um, that is going to be for the good of humanity and push humanity forward. The French model, uh, following Rousseau, uh, implies much more state intervention and sees the state as the protector. Right? So that's Locke versus Rousseau. Okay. So the chapter opens, and this book is a little dated, but there are Tony Blair and New Labour being re-elected in uh, 2001. It talks about Iraq and other issues. Um, and and it, it also focuses on, on some fundamental differences between the UK and US democracy. Right. We mentioned, I think, a few couple of classes ago, we talked about uh, Prime Minister Question Time, which happens every Wednesday, and there's this very deliberative, right, very almost combative body, where um, the, the members of Parliament get to ask the Prime Minister uh, any question that they, they want. And um, you, can, you can check it out, actually, on, on YouTube. Whereas the equivalent for us would be our State of the Union, which is once a year, and, um, and it is not very uh, de deliberative, right? MPs, what are MPs? Well, first let's start with what is parliamentary government? The head of government is the prime minister and other cabinet uh, uh, officials are confirmed by the House of Commons, right? The, uh, and the lower house uh, remains for form for formally accountable to, to it. So as we said before, when we were studying different forms of government, in parliamentary government, there's a fusion of power between the executive and legislative branches of, of government. Right? Whereas in the US, the president and the Congress are elected separately, and, and there's a separation of powers between the executive and the, legislative, and the legislature. The MPs are members of parliament, obviously. When we talk about what is the government in British politics, we're talking about the cabinet plus the additional ministers. And, um, and why is the British system of government referred to as the Westminster system? The reason is, is because Parliament was, was housed in Westminster Palace. Okay, so the chapter talks about Parliament and its re the reform of Parliament. Um, under Tony Blair's government, um, an es estimated more than 600 members of the, of the House of Lords um, uh, were eliminated, right? And that was 
up until recently, the unelected upper chamber of, of, um, of the parliament. There's also been devolution. We defined before uh, the UK as a unitary state, right, where power is centralized. And most uh, states in the world are unitary states. But a difference uh, in this case is that Britain is, is engaging in devolution. That means the transfer of decision-making power to lower levels of, of government. So for this reason, you have a parliament in Scotland, um, which almost broke away right last year or earlier this year. Uh, there's a parliament in Wales as, as well as in Northern Ireland. There's always also concern about human rights. Okay, under the Blair government, the UK adopted the European Convention as as British law, enabling UK citizens to take human rights cases directly to, to British courts. Right. So let's talk a bit about, about the, Britain's political development. Britain began developing um, conditions favorable to democracy as, at, at fairly early stages. As an institution, Parliament fostered elites opposed to royal absolutism and dedicated to the rule of law. English nationalism uh, took a form favorable to a democratic political culture. Private enterprise promoted national wealth and the development of a, of a democratic middle class. Political parties in Britain embraced uh, democratic rather than undemocratic ideologies and brought in disadvantaged groups. Um, education fostered freedom of thought, scientific inquiry, as well as artistic creativity. So when we think about um, British political development, we have to think about evolution and moderation. Evolution and moderation. Hope you can see that. In England's gradual development of, of democracy started at a fairly early stage. It had many uh, favorable conditions for democracy. After the collapse of the Roman Empire, England was governed by, by successive monarchs um, uh, until the middle of the 7th century. From the Middle Ages onwards, monarchs governed increasingly from the basis of what we know of as the divine right of kings, meaning God, God said I'm king, so that's why I, I'm, I'm king. Right? And this provided the, the legal basis for a sovereign monarchy or absolutism meaning that the monarch was the supreme political authority in the land and enjoyed uh, the right to absolute power. This coincided with the development of parliament, starting way back in the 13th century. And as a state institution, this, this is an incubator of democracy, as well as the Magna Carta, right? a list of rights and privileges that, uh, that, that King John of England signed under pressure from English uh, noblemen. All right. So the Magna Carta is a document specifying the rights of English elites in such matters as taxation, uh, judicial appointments, and private, pro pri private property. So what did the Magna Carta imply? I'm running out of room here. What did the Magna Carta imply? It implies that there, is, there are limits to the king's sovereign power. And the monarchy was not above the law. The monarchy was not above the law. Pretty radical for at that point in, in, in history. Something else very important in um, British, uh, or I should say English, political development is what is called the Glorious Revolution. Glorious Revolution. Um, so there was a revolution in 1688 where the parliament actually deposed King James II, who was a Roman Catholic, and asserted uh, rights over the rights of parliament. The parliament actually gave the crown to the Protestant uh, King William, who was a Dutch prince, and his British wife, Queen Mary. So the Glorious Revolution is also known as the Bloodless Revolution was the last genuine revolution in Britain. Because there was little armed resistance in England uh, to William and Mary, the revolution is called 
the bloodless revolution. Okay. So again, when you think about British political development, think about moderation and, and evolution.